Ready to start your ESG journey? Get going today with Social Suite, and you could start reporting publicly in 30 days. With investor pressure mounting and regulations just around the corner, there's never been a better time to start your ESG reporting. Social Suite takes the complexity out of environmental, social, and governance reporting. Social Suite helps organizations to measure, monitor, and report on their progress with fast, simple, and affordable software. Create value through ESG in order to raise capital, improve brand and reputation, as well as mitigate risk. Social Suite has helped almost 100 micro to small cap companies report on ESG, with some starting their baseline report in under 60 minutes and reporting publicly within 30 days. ESG is a lot easier than you think, and you're probably already doing it. So take your sustainability reporting to the next level with measurable progress. Start your ESG journey today with Social Suite, an ESG software company for micro to small caps. Visit socialsuitehq.com. That's social, S-U-I-T-E-H-Q.com to learn more. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Alan Grafman, CEO of IDW Media Holdings. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is IDW on the NYSC American. IDW is an integrated media company providing compelling stories and characters for global audiences. The IDW Publishing and IDW Entertainment businesses acquire IP for holistic franchise development across comics and graphic novels television, and other entertainment platforms, and leverage established stories from their creative partners. Alan was recently named CEO in August 2022 and has been in charge of leading the turnaround for IDW. As IDW's chairman, Howard Jonas, stated in the press release announcing Alan's appointment, and I quote here, He is a dynamic leader with deep experience in the industries in which IDW operates with a clear, thoughtful vision for accelerating IDW's transformation into a media powerhouse, end quote. I've known IDW for many years now, interviewing multiple CEOs on behalf of the company, so I invited Alan on the show to better understand why under his leadership, that could be the catalyst for change. We also discuss IDW's business strategy, their focus on developing original IP while maintaining and expanding their core publishing business, the entertainment industry trends, and Alan's vision for the company and where he wants to see it in three to five years. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Alan Grafman, CEO of IDW Media Holdings. Alan, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Great to be here, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So I'm going to start off with a quick preface. I've known IDW for... A little bit. I've uh, seen, seen IDW present at many, many conferences. So, But you are new to the company. You've now been man, uh, CEO for about six months. So my goal with wanting to have our conversation today is that you know the company is in a little bit of a, a turnaround situation. I want to better understand you know where we were, where we are today, and where we're going. So to s- kind of s- start everything off here, this is the question I ask everybody to kick off the interview here. If you were to describe IDW in one sentence, what would that be? IDW is the only investable public company that is focused exclusively on publishing graphic novels, comic books, and turning them into television and media entertainment. Very clear. All right. Now let's look at that history a little bit. Like I said, I've known the company for a long time. You know, I've seen uh, multiple CEOs present at conferences over the years. You know, so how, so- how about it? Yeah, how about it? <laughs> so, you know, tell us a little bit about the history of the company. What was the original thesis for its founding? And then maybe, well, let's start there and then we'll catch us up to today. So before we go into ancient history, let me go into four years where I've been involved with the company. About four years ago, I was recruited to join the board of directors uh, and then became chair of the audit committee. 
So for three and a half years, I was able to, um, as chair of the audit committee, I was able to be helpful to the previous CEO. I was able to clearly focus with the CFO on the audit committee materials and issues, and the board at large was able to bring opportunities to the company. And um, in August, that changed when the uh, with the, the with the shareholder uh, Howard Jonas, who's uh, very well known to your audience, asked if I would um, uh, really he he requested that I take the CEO role because he was making a change. Uh, once I clarified that he had already planned to make the change because I was uh, very happy, uh, you know, contributing as a board member. Once he made clear that he had made that decision and that the role was open. I was delighted. It builds on decades of my experience in the sector at places like Archie Comics and Disney and ABC and Hallmark. So I had a little bit of a three and a half years of a head start with the company in the CEO role and stepped into it, uh, as it were, knowing a lot, but also not knowing a lot. And so that's been the past six and a half months. Uh, before that, I did have some contact with the company. The company has been around for, for decades, um, but I, I don't want to speak to that too much because I, I don't have firsthand knowledge of those times. There were a number of people that preceded me uh, from the founder through successors uh, to me as a CEO joining six months ago. Absolutely. So how would you say the thesis when you originally were part of the company four years ago, how would you say the thesis for the strategic direction of the company has changed and then we'll get into maybe what the direction is now moving forward. So one of the major changes that took place over that, call it four-year period, is previously there was capital deployed into what I will call one-off television properties that became successful. But it was, uh, think about it, if you're a venture capital and you invest in one or two projects, that is not the venture capital mode. Television investing is similar you need to have a, a large number of projects going forward to have one that's successful. So the company has moved from having a lot of capital deployed into a television project to now focused entirely on licensing our intellectual property to others who will be responsible for funding it and taking it forward as a finished entertainment product. I can speak more on that, Robert, but... Um, but let me pause here to see if that's uh, sufficient. No, that's good. And and I think it, it will, it'll probably be good. Maybe we take a quick step back. And for folks that aren't fully aware of all the IP that's within the IDW portfolio, can you give us kind of a look into the full portfolio of properties there? Um, certainly. So in the publishing sector this year, we've announced that we will be issuing over 1,000 SKUs which will be comprised of between one and 200 individual specific intellectual properties. Um, some of those are well-known. Our licensed business it consists of well-known brands such as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Star Trek, um, and others. On the graphic novels, we are now focused on original graphic novels. So we have ownership. That's a second change. There's more of a focus on ownership than previous. And then we turn those into television. Uh, we aspire to have a number of projects. Uh, we have currently 12 that have been optioned. And uh, when the time comes, I can describe that whole television process. So it's now not capital intensive. It is licensing intellectual property to others who develop it for, for television, which is very cost uh, very costly. For the graphic novels, we do fund that to get that published and printed and shipped. Very good. So for, also let's give a little perspective, you know, of the titles that, you know, in the past that you've licensed, created into television shows, you know, uh, you mentioned a few names or on the licensing side, you know, Teenage Mutant Turtle, Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, I know uh, is Lock and Key. That's the name of the show, right? If I remember Yes. Correctly. So yeah. let me speak to Lock and Key. Lock yeah. and Key was a very big Success, which had a very long runway. And it's really important for investors to understand this. So Lock and Key was originally put under contract by IDW in 2008. 
it uh, there was a number of published uh, properties in the lock and key series uh, over a period of years and it took about 10 years for it to come to fruition as a television project uh, it, under netflix it went for three seasons was an enormously successful series for idw um, and the point here is when a series does get to television uh, it can be very uh, profitable uh, but it take, it has a long runway so if i may continue for to publish a graphic novel that runway is six nine twelve fifteen months from when people come together and we like to be the partner of choice and i can come back to that to getting it on shelves to where it's generating revenue so maybe 15 months perhaps on the outside it can be longer but if you think of a bell curve i think of 12 months perhaps television is a year to two years to three years to 10 years if you talk to people in the industry robert they will tell you that again the median might be three years from when something is available and even optioned to getting it into production could be two or three years so it's a long runway for television absolutely what would you say is, you know you you mentioned the the three pillars of the business what would you say has been the more strategic focus now that you're taking the helm here is it really developing that original ip right now well let me recast the question in, in a certain fashion um, we're active uh in three sectors uh, graphic novels and comics are one, so call that uh, publishing IP. Uh, entertainment is almost exclusively focused on IP that comes from our publishing enterprise, so that's a second. And the third is digital, where that would be another strategic change, uh, Robert, to call that out. So when I got there, we were on a, a platform that was insufficient and uh, overseas and ineffective and unresponsive. So over the past six months, we have been transitioning to a Shopify platform, which your listeners may know, perhaps the world's largest provider of these types of uh, platform and web services. So the publishing platform, very solid, profitable on an operating level, consistently putting out great product. Entertainment, lumpy, volatile, and very hard to predict with a long runway. And on the digital, we have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the process for, uh, I mean, I know all three pillars are very important for the company, right? That that only makes sense. Why why would you put out a slide that's talking about the three pillars of the company and all the, the, the strategy around that? But it seems like right now where the industry tailwinds are heading is there's just such a need and a desire for that original IP. So tell us a little bit about the company's process for creating new IP, working with creators, to bring on new graphic novels and graphic comics. So lo love to hear more there. So Robert, um, IDW is striving to be the partner of choice in creator and also business sectors. So, so what does that mean broadly? And then I can get more specific. So even when we turn someone away, we want them to say, you know what? I like dealing with those people. I felt that the, they gave me uh, their best feedback. Although we didn't come together this time, I'm going to bring them my next project. And the more we can do that, the more full the funnel will be. So we are, as I mentioned, we have a very significant license business. We're striving to have more original graphic novels where we have ownership. Because on the licensed properties, Sonic the Hedgehog and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Star Trek, those are licensed properties. We are the publisher of the comics, as it were. But we don't own, we don't control the media rights, and we don't participate in all of the ancillary rights. When we develop an original graphic novel, when we work with illustrators and writers and creators, uh, we negotiate and we endeavor to have as much ownership opportunity long term uh, as possible. And so, when we have that, it opens, it, it makes us a more successful. IDW company with greater terminal value and with greater long-term value. So we are spending significant time developing original graphic novels where we have an ownership slash control position. Got it. So when you're evaluating a potential idea or creators to, to work with, right, to for that original IP, 
what are some of your key criteria? Because it's not just like, all right, this is cool. And wow, that sounds awesome. You know, because there's a lot of cool and just awesome ideas out there. But are you thinking it all from about it from the lens of saying, okay, this will be, this could be significantly valuable on its own, but we also want to think about, well, how will this look on TV or as a movie? You know, I mean, is, is that the thought process? So yes, broadly. So we have editors whose job it is to, to do exactly what you've said. We have a media and television executives who now together with the editors are able to provide input, not making the decision necessarily, but providing input. So that means like, wow, we haven't seen something like this. And what we're finding now, Robert, is that because of the earlier uh, ability to look at these different opportunities, the ability to go into the market, sometimes before it's even put to print. So for instance, big funnel, the, the editors are working, the TV and media people are providing input. They see something, they say, okay, when you get that signed, we're going to go into the market because we think that's very exciting. And they are then able to go into the market before it's even published. So rather than waiting 12 months to see if it's a big hit, we're able to go to people and say, hey, this is going to be published. Here's why this is a, a valuable opportunity. And so there's a much more cohesive approach to evaluating by the company, by the editors, by the TV executives. So Alan, you know, from what you can tell us, you know, what, what are some titles that are either currently available or from what you're seeing in terms of customer feedback or just feedback are, have been working, you know, that you've been getting that selling and all that jazz. So let me highlight, let me broaden it a little bit, Robert, because I, I do love all the children in different ways, but equally if, uh, as a parent, I can say that, and maybe, maybe you can too. I, so here's I, the point. I know where you're going with them. You're okay. Good. So on the licensed properties, um, the last Ronin has been a New York Times bestseller. Has sold way beyond initial expectations. Has been has been viewed as a major success in the licensed sector. So we're very excited about that. In the original graphic novels, um, there's a, there's a couple properties. I'll call out one. Uh, Ballad for Sophie is viewed as being uh, a very compelling story. And then with our, um, we, we have a, an imprint called Top Shelf. There has been March by John Lewis and They Call Us Enemy by George Sakai uh, that are viewed as a great works of creativity. So we have across, uh, we have across all those sectors, um, IP that we feel and has proven to be successful. Very good. So I want to talk about some current industry, both tailwinds and headwinds. You know, obviously the tailwinds, it's very clear, you know, every studio and streamer is always evaluating new IP that can be the next big franchise or, you know, hit TV show, you know, lock and key is an example. But then also on the headwinds side, they're also, it seems like there's a, you know, when it comes to the amount of spend, um, from some of these studios and streamers, it seems to be, yeah, the money is there, but it's a bit more careful. So love to hear your thoughts on, on both sides of the coin. So yes, it's um, the spend on television entertainment. Um, and we should also talk about publishing in a moment. Um, let's start with publishing because that's the majority of our revenue. Uh, there was a tremendous upsurge during COVID in the industry and uh, we benefited from that to a degree. But out of that, we now have a, a tremendous relationship with Penguin Random House. That's our distributor. So we're building on that. And we expect to have a, a great year on the publishing side. On the television side, there's been a, a bit of a pullback, maybe 10%. It's still a colossal addressable market, depending on how you slice it, 10 to 10 billion. We don't need a lot. We only need, last year, we had three television projects, which was exceptional. And it had enormous impact. And unfortunately, uh, it increases the lumpiness. And investors don't like lumpiness. And we got plenty of it with three shows in one year. So yes, uh, headwinds on the publishing side, perhaps, perhaps not, uh, because of uh, the, you know, many industries uh, got a big push uh, out of necessity during COVID. And then, uh, 
have receded. We, we don't know that'll be the case in publishing. Uh, we think perhaps not. On entertainment, definitely a bit of a, a, a pullback on the big spend, still a colossal addressable market. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm because, you know, you look at the the court, your 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 Q1 2023 that you just announced. Um, I, I guess not just announced. We're recording this on April 4th, but you put it out on, on the 15th, I think it was. You know, it's it, it definitely addresses the lumpiness that you're talking about. Right. So how as now, you know, new CEO been there for six, you know, on the job now for six months. How are you talking about the lumpiness in the industry and with what the company's traditionally experience how are you addressing that with investors so um in every instance we say a couple things uh, we say can't predict the future it's a long runway we have 12 projects that have been optioned by really significant by the most significant buyers of ip and developers of television and long-term shareholders will be rewarded so real quick question on the publishing side of things, you know, it's clear, you know, you, you're, you're already working with some very well-known brands, right? Sonic, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Star Trek, you know, where's, where's some of the growth coming from on that side? Are you working with other um, IP holders on saying, Hey, you know, if you're looking to make a switch, you know, here we go, we're ready for you and all that stuff. So how, how are you bringing in new business on that front? So on the license front, we have been more discerning. We are now focused on the bigger properties, which you just rattled off. And we have a, several in the pipeline that could be announced uh, within the next month or two that will build up uh, that business. So we're very, um, we're focused, we're discerning, and we're effective on behalf of our partners. All right. Um, so, so on the, on the, Let's talk the competitive landscape a little bit on, I mean, do you, who would you say is a real direct competitor for IDW that, that folks can better wrap their heads around like, okay, IDW is trying to be this or, you know, oh, they're very similar to that. You know, what would you say there? So I can go through the litany and, and I will in response to your question. Of course, I have to say we stand alone. We are the partner of choice. Long-term shareholders will be rewarded. So Robert, having said that, we don't compete with DC. They have their world of superhero characters. We don't compete with Marvel. They have their world of superhero characters. Those are the two giants. Okay, next group, a, a, um, a close second group would include ourselves. IDW has the only investable public company in this comic book television sector. Recently, uh, within the past year or two, Dark Horse, a, a similarly sized company, was sold to a foreign entity, in uh, primarily in the video game sector, if I remember correctly. Um, another company uh, is Image, which uh, is has a different model because they are uh, essentially close to a cooperative where they're owned uh, by their participants, closer, and I, I don't wish to describe them a great deal because I, I don't know them greatly. Another company is Boom, which is close in size and uh, approach. Another, there are other companies. Those cover, I believe, the the ones that are, are significant and thriving. There is another sector that uh, are passing through perhaps difficult times, and I'm not going to enumerate those. Very good. So you know, Alan, you, like I said, you know, a couple times now, you're, you've been CEO for six months, but you've been in the company for four years. So you've gone through the dog and pony show. You've had calls with investors. I'm sure you've done a couple of presentations even already. You know, even after investors have a chance to speak with you, see the presentation, kind of, you know, read through a couple of things on the website. What do you think investors still get confused about when evaluating IDW? Some frequently asked questions. Maybe we can address them here. Well, uh, the major question, fortunately, Robert, uh, you've, uh, you've uh, asked it, is the long period of time to develop an entertainment project. So that's one. Two, most many of the investors have been in for a long period of time and have suffered great pain. And uh, I understand that. 
and it's uh, there may have been irrational exuberance uh, for a period of time. And I'm a business builder, not a stock promoter, but it's possible that the value of our enterprises is, is not recognized because of the pain that preceded uh, preceded over a period of many years. So if you take the 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 pain point away and you look at the company as it is, you would be hard pressed to find a company that does what we do, that's investable. And I'm not speaking even to the, uh, I'll call it the vault of intellectual property that we control. Um, I can't describe it as massive. It's not DC, it's not Marvel, uh, but it's something. So take away the emotional pain of five years, recognize that as a going uh, enterprise, uh, we are unique in that we are investable, recognize that when we're successful, uh, the operating leverage is significant with Ronin on the publishing side, with Lock and Key on the entertainment side, recognize it takes a long time, recognize it's a very competitive market. And uh, the short point is we have been in business for decades. And I suspect with the uh, the backing that we have from our primary shareholder, uh, Mr. Howard Jonas, uh, who has created great wealth for many people over many years, uh, we're on the road to, uh, we're aspiring to and plan to repeat that success uh, uh, on our own scale. Absolutely. So another kind of devil's advocate type of question I ask it to everybody on here. You know, in, in, Alan, in your opinion, what would you say are some of the company's downside risks? Okay. So that's like when you're interviewing for a role, like what are your, what are your, Oh, I'm very aggressive. Uh, you know, what are the downside risks? Okay. The uh, Okay, let me speak. <laughs> okay, I, I, I have to give you a great answer. Let me give you a great answer. Uh, the great answer is that we need to be more effective operationally in order to make certain that we are using the funds entrusted to us are used effectively. Full stop. Full stop. All right. So, I mean, if, if kind of reading into the tea leaves there, it's just basically like, we just have to make sure we're picking the right partners to work with, more or less, right? The right um, projects to develop. We, I mean, need, we need to be successful externally and internally, is perhaps I would uh, phrase it. Yeah. Because I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to is just like, okay, this, you know, we want as many lock and keys as we can get, right? Like that's uh, at the end of the day, that that that's what it is. Um, so for investors, we have a great combination. We have a publishing business that appeals to, I'll say risk averse, reasonably steady, reasonably significant, continues on an incremental growth, we'd like it to be great. And we have a very lumpy entertainment business that has breakout potential, tremendous operating leverage, and uh, very difficult to capture. And right. we have an emerging digital business that we, we need to, we need to uh, nurture because it has, uh, it's, it's lagging. Right. But, uh, by the same token, um, you know, I had the, the heat shield deflector on against crypto and NFT and meta, those <laughs> types of things. Uh, I got a lot of them at the beginning. Sure. Those types of things I, I gently turned aside. We need to be great at what we currently do, which is publishing great graphic novels and comic books, taking it to television. Um, and um, I want to make certain that we pick up on the uh, digital front. By the way, we've not lost money on the digital front, which many, many digital comics and motion comics, there have been dozens of those. So my background is private equity and venture capital. I saw many of those over the past five years. And um, and IDW has not uh, lost money in that sector. For sure. And look, the reason I, and like, I'm, I'm fully getting of that. Like, look, you have this steady publishing business, right? Where you work, license it out, you're doing the work for these very well-known brands, you know, and I think what makes IDW, the most interesting traditionally has been like, oh, well, there is this upside television 
you know, potential where, you know, they take one of their original properties and it gets option two, you know, like a lock and key, which is why I keep saying like, all right, it's just, you get more lock and keys. Like, there you go. Like, that's what everybody is kind of traditionally always thought of when it comes to the upside potential with right. IDW. And in addition, I want to um, broaden that a little bit. Yeah. Let's we see. can, because lock and key, that type of success that, that's that's you know it's, it's lightning in a bottle in some respects. Lightning in a thank you. Yeah, it's I lightning in a bottle. Yep. I I, uh, I would not want people to leave this call to think that oh they're in search of the next lock and key. Well, sure, but the company is not dependent on that. Um, the company is de- is dependent on great publishing, producing great results, entertainment putting into the market. We have twelve that are optioned, pushing them into green light, which is hard work getting them produced, then it generates, you know, low seven figures potentially of revenue. And behind that could be a wild card in digital, whether it's digital comics, whether it is what I call fandom, uh, customer engagement, fan engagement. There's lots of ways. There's lots of ways. And we are uh, just beginning to um, experience that. Um, As I said, we've moved from one platform to the Shopify platform. People next month will see a, a new website that will facilitate uh, more direct to consumer, which we have not had much. And then, uh, and, and then we'll be following on with additional um, additional resources that will allow us to engage with uh, consumers. You know, operationally, what would you say was the the flaw that you saw, and now you're you, now that you're you're at the helm, you're working to to fix because you mentioned how you're looking to fix you know, internally, how things were somewhat done, you know, what, what did you see was, was happening? That was the flaw. And how are you intending on fixing that if you haven't already done so? So we, we, yeah, so we we always, uh, we always stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Right. Important work was done. Um, I'd like to broaden it to, to give a broader answer. Um, Mm -hmm. Having been on the board for three and a half years, I, I thought I knew a lot. It was less than I thought. Um, and I think every honest CEO, I, I wasn't outside the firm, but it wasn't like I was promoted from oh, within. No. But you know so, this, for every investor that comes and sits on a board, they're like, oh my goodness, I had no, you know, <laughs> that you start seeing you start seeing a little bit more behind the curtain. You're like, oh my, either both oh, like, oh, oh my goodness, or oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, right, you know, So it's a little bit like, um, uh, it's a little bit. I, I want to be cautious here. Um, and by so the by the way, I asked that question by saying, with all due respect to everyone that came before you, like every, you know, yeah. it is it is what everyone at the end of the day you you would expect everyone's trying is doing their best, right? Yeah, exactly. So so, uh, so, I'll, so you know. much was visible. You know, there's an ocean behind me, perhaps. Um, and in oceans, you sometimes encounter things that you think you see, but a lot of it is not visible. And that's all I'm going to say about that. There was a lot, uh, there's a lot I did not know. And there's a lot of work that's been done. And there's a lot of work to do. Fair enough. All right. Well, my my next question then for you, Alan, is, you know, from your perspective, where do you want to see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are some of the inflection points that'll get you there? So um, in three years, we... Uh, my expectation is we will be somewhere between significantly to massively profitable. Uh, but I think the bar is we are profitable. Uh, I'll say in three years, uh, people in the internet, I've had people who are, know the company well, even from the inside who say, Alan, everybody should know it's a three-year turnaround. Okay. So let's, 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 maybe it is, maybe it can be shortened. Um, the key inflection point is for stability and for us to be the partner of choice, for us to deepen the relationship with Penguin Random House, for us to deliver to partners in the entertainment space what we say we're going to do, and for us to accelerate our capabilities in digital. Those are among the inflection points, uh, Robert, that I think will have a material impact. As you know, it's a capital project. Sometimes I've said it's a capital project. How much time goes in with all of the the paperwork and and the architecture and the and the land being acquired and digging a hole? You don't see anything, you know, for 
two years. And then you start to see a building go up. So much of our work, especially in the entertainment side, uh, and to some extent, even on the digital side, is that work that is not below ground, but not immediately visible. Very good. So, you know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, legendary investor Howard Jonas is a chairman of the company. Um, we actually did a um, great interview on here on this on Planet Microcap with uh, Joe Boscovich, um, where we he basically talked about, you know, Howard's career and, you know, how he's just, you know, is idolized and, and just really been successful and just wanting folks to learn and know a little bit more about him. So in, I always ask companies on here, you know, how is your, you know, shareholder base sometimes maybe um, affected your decision-making process to how much do you listen to shareholders? But I think we'll just specifically talk about one because he's definitely the elephant in the room for sure, um, like without a doubt. So, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, working with Howard and the strategic direction, you know, how much is he hands-on? Does he kind of, when it comes to strategy, love to learn more about the relationship with Howard and you know, his his support for IDW and the direction you're taking the company? So I, I wish to be cautious, so I'll only speak from my direct experience. That That's all um, I want. Um, because for someone with the wealth of successes that, uh, that Howard Jonas has had, um, I can speak to going back 20, 22 years ago when I was president of Archie Comics, I met Howard and he invested in the company. And that was the beginning we were together a bit for a year or two 20 years ago. Over the years, periodically, I would uh, come come to him with a project. Uh, we stayed in touch uh, generally. Um, about five years ago, I came with a uh, an opportunity with uh, with a uh, an animation company. Uh, we didn't come together. And then four years ago, we came together. So a couple things. Um, having the committed long-term capital in the company um, allows the company to focus on a long-term opportunity. Uh, so that's one factor. Um, I feel when I took this role, I said, you know, Howard, is there anything, because, you know, Howard has a, a big world. And if you have a chance, he's written a couple books and, and they're fabulous books to read. He has a big world and he's an even bigger heart and uh, I feel blessed to uh, be in his world uh, to this, this small degree, because as you may know, I, I believe last I checked, he's involved and possibly chairman of five different companies. So um, there's not a lot of contact. There's just the right amount of contact. Um, and so the short version is supportive, uh, allows the company uh, a certain level of support that is uh, that's positive and um I think most people would recognize that as a very strong plus. Absolutely. All right. Well, to close us out here, Alan, you know, and you thank you for answering all my questions that you know I, I threw at you today. You know, it, been CEO only for six months. You know, but you've been in this company for for a little bit, for four years. And I mean, it's not an easy job being a public company CEO. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your experience uh, being you know, IDW CEO thus far and, you know, what you're hoping to see from how, how this role can continue to, you know, you grow within it and, and expand. So Robert, that's, that's a very nice question to ask. Um, and as I give it a, a moment's thought, when I took the role on the very first day, I addressed uh, the entire staff. Uh, maybe, you know, almost none of them knew me, uh, maybe one or two did. And I said, in addition to our uh, professional aspirations for IDW to be successful, my personal wish for all of uh, everyone involved in the company, that it be the professional experience that they will look back on and reflect has one of the greatest work experiences they've ever had. Now, I can't promise that. Um, I can aspire to it and, and I can work towards it. But so many things are, are out of my control that it would be hubris for any CEO of a public company. Uh, it reminds me of the story about uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who was commander of all allied forces in Europe. He ran for president. He was elected. And Harry Truman said, poor Ike, he's going to get in the office and say, do this, do that, and nothing's going to happen. 
Well, that's not the case here, but there are so many factors. Um, in my experience, if you come authentically to speak to the issues or not speak when it's not appropriate to, people appreciate that. And and I want everyone who views this to the very end, perhaps uh, there may be less than start, uh, perhaps it's a big number. I want them that they can hold me, Alan Grafman, CEO of IDW, and IDW to those aspirations. Very good. Well, Alan, I think that's a great place to end. You know, with that, where can our audience go and find more information on IDW? So, um, as you know, we are public IDW Media Holdings, uh, as you said at the beginning, New York Stock Exchange, Amex, IDW. And our website uh, has a lot of information I would encourage people to listen to, much of which we've covered on this call, Robert. Absolutely. And that website's idwmediaholdings.com. Alan, thank you so much for joining me here today. Really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Thank you so much. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.